Hello, everybody. And uh, while we're waiting for everyone to still kind of join on, I'll, I'll, I'll make a few announcements. Um, so if you haven't registered and you're interested, you know, we will be having an early uh, detection cancer conference coming up in October. Uh, we have an exciting uh, list of speakers and many from our international client alliance um, for cancer early detection. So we have multiple international partners as well represented. Um, so it should be um, really exciting and uh, we're looking forward to all those speakers. Um, and for our upcoming FIND seminars, um, we'll have one on looking at metabolic health and another to follow on Alzheimer's disease. And so we're really, we're excited to check those out in the near future. Um, but today we are, my pleasure to host uh, Sudi Chanson, who's very talented uh, um, IP attorney, as well as um, entrepreneur, as well as engineer, so many, many hats, many different great experiences. So I'll give her a, a brief introduction here. Um, so Sudi is the founding managing counsel at STLG Law Firm, counseling domestic and international clients in IP and technology transactions and a wide range of technologies. In 2016, she formed Press Company, developing a line of medical devices for mothers and infants. Sudi has over 25 years of operational experience in technology, business management and law and startup and Fortune 100 companies, including uh, Shuring Plow Pharmaceuticals, Healy Packard, Avantech Vascular, and the law firms of Heller, Etman, and Townsend and Townsend. Sudi serves on a board of leadership capacities with several organizations, including the Association of Women in Science, STEM, to market National Accelerator, Licensing Executive Society USA Canada, California Lawyer Association, and the Palo Alto Bar Association. Sudi is a commissioner with the city of Menlo Park and an active hands-on volunteer with several civic organizations, uh, including Deputy Ventures and Entrepreneurship Training Program for currently and formerly incarcerated. Um, Sudi has instructed courses in IP licensing and entrepreneurship at the University of California, Stanford University, and European institutions. She's the co-author of the book, Women Securing the Future of Trust, Identity, Privacy, Protection, Safety, Security for the Internet of Things. So, yeah, quite, quite a great background and quite an acronym at the end there. So, yeah, you know, Sudi's been, is, is a great, you know, super instrumental in multiple activities and also been a great friend and help, helpful in the multiple areas. So I'm really, really excited to have you today. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ryan, for that wonderful um, introduction. It's very kind of you. And thank you, Ashley, for um, helping put this uh, together. And um, today I'd like to just go, there's always so much that can be said, but as much as I can without making it too legalese, um, go over some of the challenges that are uh, today facing uh, companies, especially companies that are working on digital health uh, technology. Ryan already went uh, to the description and I think as you age, at least you can uh, rely on your years of experience is something that uh, you just kind of put in your bio. Um, so I just actually have a very uh, small and boutique uh, practice that uh, we've been running since 2008. And uh, you can read more about us online, obviously. And we handle all sorts of technology areas, and mainly some of that is because of my own background, having been in pharma as well as um, you know, technology and semiconductor area. So today, what I'd like to cover uh, are the following topics. What are the technology platforms and healthcare sectors? Why IP is important to them? The types of IP that you can um, take advantage of? And the two key ones that we're gonna discuss are um, trade secrets and patents. What are the patentability requirements and how does that transfer and relate and what is unique about digital health? And um, so given that digital health 
you know, is increasing in market share and a lot of innovations, what much needed that are happening, how do we go about applying for these uh, protections and what is needed to pass, what are the most key important areas for digital health to even pass the first gate of, is it something you can even patent even before you get to prior art, has somebody done it before kind of questions. And then some practical tips and if time permitting, going actually through an example. As um, with all other things, um, IP, of course, uh, we're going to have our <laughs> disclaimer uh, for whatever we are discussing today. This is more educational. And um, so what is unique about digital health? Let me just frame it here, and uh, we're going to go through more in detail uh, in a little bit, is that digital health innovations often are taking what we call abstract ideas, uh, at least in the lingo of the uh, patent world. And what we're talking about is how these ideas and innovations are actually being applied um, into the innovation sector and also in the way we want to patent them. So the challenge that uh, digital health faces is that abstract ideas themselves are not eligible for patenting. So these uh, digital health innovations do often face patent eligibility challenges. Now we'll go through how this whole comes about and what to look for and how to make it work for you. So typically what happens is it's very convoluted, even for patent attorneys who've been doing this for a long time. Um, one, of course, technology is new, but more important is not the technology, rather the rules and the laws are always changing. And I'll go through a brief uh, history of the change as well. So it basically comes to the fact that we have to, innovators, myself, you, and others have to explain what we have done. And the patent office at the other end is really not able to grasp within, not that they're not smart, they are. It's just a grasp of the framework of the legal structure that they need you to explain yourself. And then we have all of these different standards, whether it's the European standards or the ever evolving and changing a pendulum of the US patent law. It makes it very, very difficult. So when you look at digital health, we can look at the technology platforms and also what are the sectors. When we look at um, AI, uh, healthcare sectors, as well as digital health in a broader scope, is that we're looking at imaging and diagnostic, personalized medicine, consumer integrated health, robotics. So, so it's a range of purely um, software as well as integrated software and hardware like robotic surgery. And you also use it for drug dis discovery and hospital workflow. Now from a technology platform perspective, there's a lot involved. Uh, deep learning, robotics, personal assistant, natural language, you know, big data and an analysis and predictive modeling. So there's a range of these and you know more than I do about uh, the business aspect and why it is so important. So now what does that mean? So when we look at, first of all, let's, let's look at this. When we are talking about intellectual property, we're talking about the umbrella of so many different kinds of doctrines, which are all interrelated. You've got patents, you've got uh, trademarks, you've got copyrights, trade secrets, and a range of other type of IP that we usually don't necessarily address, at least not in the technology field, which is unfair competition, computer and internet law, moral rights, and rights of publicity. Now, typically a single innovation can take advantage of multiple types of IP. You can have in a single product, and product I mean to use that term more uh, generically, maybe there's software or hardware or a combination, is that you can have like a trademark protected, you can have copyrights protected and uh, patents as well. So what usually how you pick which one you want to use, you kind of go through a very, you know, this is a simplified version of what uh, your questions you may want to ask yourself. You always, from a patent perspective, what you have to focus on is, does it have utility? Does it have an app, you know, uh, application that is useful in in um, European practice, they call it a little bit different. They call it that has an application in, in industry and in US, we call it utility. So from that perspective, if it doesn't, then you, know, you have to kind of go to the other realm, which has to do with trademarks, maybe design patents and copyrights. And if at 
Uh, same also with trade secrets, by the way, because let's say you have an organization and how your organization works, that is a trade secret as well. So that's from a business side of things. But from an invention or innovation perspective, if it's something you decide whether it's something you want to keep secret, then you go the trade secret route and we'll go through that as well. And if it does actually have utility and it's new, then you may want to go after a utility patent. So there is a whole bunch of questions you have to ask yourself and how many of them do you pursue is really a business strategy decision that should incorporate your IP strategy. So from a digital health perspective, the main two things we're going to talk about today are patents and trade secrets. And of course, when we are talking patents, we are talking about either utility or design, and then making sure we understand that utility actually applies to both non-provisional and provisional. They're both utility. It's just how you treat them that is uh, different. So let's start with the one that we're going to spend less time on, um, trade secrets. Why would you want to go the route for trade secrets? First of all, what is a trade secret? You got to keep it hushed. That's the first rule that you have to know is that you have to apply reasonable practices in order to keep and maintain secrecy of something. It also has to have some commercial value, but the most important thing you have to understand is that you have to at least exercise what is a reasonable standard in the industry. You don't let people see your notebook. You don't sit at a cafe and talk about it in a way that people understand it because those are not reasonable, even though we are used to it. Okay. And also the advantages that you can keep it, as long as you keep it a secret, you know, it can go on forever. Now, a lot of innovations also, which are non-technical, um, are not patentable. So trade secret provides a good way of uh, protection. So what are, with respect to digital health, what are some of the things that you may want to use a trade secret for? And for example, you've got the software patents and some of them are of course um, patentable and we'll talk about that. But algorithms without more, uh, you know, you may protect them with encryption and then of course treat what's inside as a trade secret. Um, so you can get that protection. Um, if you have proprietary compilations, like databases are not patentable, uh, maybe copyrightable to some extent, but that's not something that you can take advantage of from a patent perspective. Also, if you have put whatever you have, your product on sale and you're selling it, that will bar you by statute from being able to get a patent. But if it's a trade secret, you know, that issue doesn't necessarily arise. So there's a lot of advantages also with respect to trade secrets and especially in its applications in areas that are so relevant to digital health, but are not uh, patentable. So um, from perspective of utility patents, which is what digital health usually wants to take advantage of, aside from, let's say, your user interface and so on that can be protected also if it's unique um, under design patents. Um, traditionally, what is it? It's process and methods of use. And that is the part that digital health really falls uh, in terms of the analysis portion. Um, machines or apparatus, compositions of matters, you know, drugs and chemicals, and whatever you're improving on in on these other categories. What is not patentable are, is a judicial doctrine that talks about laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas are not patentable. And that is where um, the crux and you know, the, the issue and uh, the major um, work that you have to do uh, has to be addressed for digital patent, digital health innovations. So generally speaking, to meet patentability requirements, the legal requirements, you can break them into four separate categories. We usually, as a lot of times in the past, would care or get involved with getting an office action and then the you know, examiner would say, oh, this is not new, that would be your novelty. Uh, or if you combine this and that together, it makes whatever you had obvious. Um, that was the other part. But then there are two other parts that we usually didn't in, in like products um, like hardware, we don't necessarily experience, uh, and that is the utility and eligibility, where the whole 101, what they call about patent eligibility comes in. 
And of course, you also have to keep in mind that because patents is a bargain for exchange, you do have to meet requirement not here that I've described as number two, which means it has to have enough content in it. It's called, that's the uh, written description uh, requirement um, that you have, to, and you have to have explained it with enough sufficiency for somebody to be able to understand and use it. So these two do become important not that the other two are not, but you have to pass these two gates before you even get to the novelty and obviousness or non-obviousness um, classification or um, evaluation from the patent office. So I don't want to make this about like a general all purpose um, presentation, but the one thing that I always want you to keep in mind is that in some ways provisional patents have been the death nail of many issues for especially independent uh, inventors and smaller uh, companies because there's a lot of dangers behind and related to poorly prepared provisional patent applications because whether it is provisional or non-provisional to be effective a provisional application has to meet the same requirements right here so if you draft something or have something drafted that is poorly meets these requirements, then you know, that provisional is not gonna give you the impact that you had hoped. And in fact, it might give you a false sense of security that, oh, I've got my uh, ideas protected because I've done that original filing, I have the filing date. And if it's not properly disclosed and described, what happens is that when the time comes for you to while your regular non-provisional application, you really don't have an effect, good effective date uh, or early date to rely on. And if you have sold it, then you know there's other issues if you have described it. So there's a whole other issues that can come about, but I wanted to make sure that that is understood that these requirements apply to both provisional and non-provisional. So they apply to utility. So we really went, this was the, how we wanted to frame today's discussion. What is unique about digital health? So we already talked about that abstract ideas by themselves are not going to pass uh, the goal in, in the sense that it's not a patentable. So what, what are the things you have to watch out for to make sure that the patent office fully appreciates what you have invented in your digital health uh, field of technology? This applies similarly to AI. Uh, so um, AI has uh, the same issues with respect to abstract ideas. So you have to be able to put enough sufficient, what we call technical content and wrap it around a specific application. And by application, I don't mean an app, I mean applying something um, for the claims that you're presenting to be examined by the patent office. So you can keep whatever we're gonna discuss next, similar and apply it to both AI and just you know even basic digital health where there is no AI component. Um, so to just give you an idea, there has been a lot of changes over the last decades when it comes to what we call software related patents. What happened is, um, if you look at, there has been a lot of changes in the patent office as well as the Supreme Court and federal circuit where um, how software related patents are treated have end up in different results. Uh, the one thing that is good news is that um, for the longest time, it was, let's say it, the pendulum was right here. Then back in the early nineties, it really got out of hand and every business method was getting patented. Then he went back the other way and it got really difficult. And then in the last few years, Patent Office has tried to come up with um, explaining the requirements, of course, as set on a broader perspective by the Supreme Court and Federal Circuit decisions. How do, you, how do the examiners have to end up uh, examining uh, your applications? Because it's, they don't get, if they don't understand it and we don't understand it, how do we bring any certainty? and we need certainty. So with the changes that happened because of the patent uh, subject matter eligibility guidance that was issued again in 2019, as you can tell, um, this is just two of such you know, comparative charts. And what happened is that there is less of such rejections. 
One, because there's more clarity around how to evaluate these uh, digital health related applications. And um, also, of course, the Supreme Court uh, uh, framework. So the good news is that it's getting better, not because it's not necessarily a question of getting easier, but it's getting more clarified as to how to do that. And, you know, for the longest time, I would always say, look at European Patent Office because they've always had a technical focus on patents and how they evaluate it. And as long as you treat this as a technical document, well, technical and legal, um, and not necessarily a pitch deck for investors or a marketing pitch, that is what you really have to focus on. So always think about how does it, how does technology play a role in what I've done? So what do you need to do? So I'm hoping that I'm not speaking too fast because I can't see your faces. Um, so we're gonna go as we have time to an example. The Patent Office has a range of different examples that they have come up with to kind of illustrate their, um, their approach and how they examine these things. So one example is about uh, a method for transmission of notifications when some medical records are updated and we're all familiar with such methodologies. Um, in this situation, what the inventors viewed to be their invention and the problems that they were solving was that there was inconsistencies among formats, um, different geographical locations um, of the information were situated in different places. And you know, this sharing was very difficult. And I know that, and I try to use these new platforms all the time, and they're still not all that great. Uh, so there is a real need to solve these issues. So what they had invented, what the applicant in this example has invented was a graphical user interface. They were converting um, the, uh, the information into a standardized format, so then we can kind of compare. And then the content server that was remote uh, would generate a message instantaneously. So this is what, you know, we will go to an example of, but this was the invention that uh, this uh, hypothetical applicant was trying to um, protect via patents. A lot of words and we go through the analysis, uh, but these were the two types of claim. There were two claims in that, this, in this hypothetical, and going through the process that the patent office has said, you can see why one worked and one, why one didn't. And you can obviously, probably, if I had to say, take a bet, you'll know the one in the green background um, is the one that would pass muster. So it can go to the next level of analysis by the patent examiner. And we'll go through why that is. Not because there's just more words, but because of the certain words that are specified. So without going through so many different steps of ana analyzing as a um, technologist, as a medical person, as somebody who's creating these uh, innovations, what you really need to keep in mind are two simple things. Is that whether these claim language as a whole and the elements, elements are the different portions of uh, your claim at the end, as we were just showing you. Uh, is that directed to a patent ineligible concept? Because remember patent, you know, abstract ideas, mental processes and so on, they're not uh, eligible for patenting. And if under the first check, on the first step, it appears to be that they're not, it's not eligible, what's the next thing you can do? Previously, patent office were just rejecting things right away. And things, this is why things have gotten better. So the next question would be, if it is, if it's some sort of a mental, or if some sort of a process that one may consider to be abstract, whether there are any other things in that claim other than what is considered uh, abstract that contains some sort of an inventive concept. And I put it in quotation because that's what the courts have used as a terminology. So what you have to show is that the combination of everything in my claim, every single claim, of course, is analyzed on its own how I have maybe put things in a certain order, orders matter sometimes in uh, patent drafting. Um, are they unconventional? So if my claim combination arrangement or order of using existing computers or telecommunication techniques is unconventional without 
relying on claim elements that are directed to the abstract idea. All that means is that you have abstract idea elements in your claim, and then you've got some things that are not abstract. Maybe the way you're organizing something, the way, because it's a step, a method uh, is a process and it's a step, and sometimes the order of steps matter. That's what you have to focus on. That's really comes down to the summary of what the patent office will go through. Now, this is, a, this is actually on the patent uh, office website. Um, it looks like a lot of lines and processes, but as medical technologists, uh, you're not, this will not be scaring you off. And it's not that complicated. Um, you know, they always start with, is this claim directed to something that you're supposed to get a patent for? Is it a machine, a process, um, uh, composition of matter? And that question gets usually answered here. Then the next part was uh, the issue right here, which is called step 2A. That's the second step. And this is what is now has been clarified and it's good news for us, right? Um, is, is this claim directed to something that is a natural phenomena or an abstract idea? And if the answer was a yes, then it goes through this series of analysis that didn't exist before 2019 when um, uh, the patent office came up with this uh, uh, current eligibility guidelines. And then, you know, all of the other things, it, you know, like at every one of these things, like the A, B, and C, these all end up as go, meaning like, yes, you pass muster of the 101. Now let's go ahead and see if there's enough description and if you have novelty and you have um, non-obviousness. Then those are the other patentability requirements. But a lot of digital health and AI related, and not just health, could be in agriculture and other areas, uh, they all would die right here and they will never go to the next analysis. So here, the patent office has provided a lot of guidelines and examples on how to go through the analysis. As, and as an applicant, as an inventor, you can actually go through this and help describe your inventions better in your invention disclosure to your patent attorney. Because they're not gonna invent for you most of the times. So you have to explain everything to them as because you are the technologist in this uh, situation. So um, these are the two, what we call prongs one and two uh, that they're going to um, pay attention to and do the analysis. So the way that the patent office analyzes these claims, it basically says, and that's a good thing because it says a claim is eligible unless, that's actually always, but you put it in a negative in this fashion is a good thing. If you say something that is a judicial exception, remember those abstract ideas, mental process, and natural phenomena, and the exception, you know, whatever it is you've invented that is considered to be one of those abstract idea type inventions is not integrated into a practical application. All it's saying is that, okay, if it's something that is just an abstract idea, again, that's the terminology that is used, put it into practice, make it real. Don't just use some generic computer system because computers now are not that novel anymore, right? We've done it before. And just because somebody is kind of like saying somebody who can do word processing on Microsoft Word doesn't mean they're a computer technologist. You know, same idea, you know, art has evolved. So if you can show that if, unless it's one of these two things, then it's patentable. And that's a good news, right? Um, so you, it's okay to have a judicial exception, judicial exception, that, that category of uh, abstract ideas, mental processes, and so on, as long as you integrate what you have into a practical application. And that's what you need to focus on. So these two prongs, remember step one, we said that, okay, is it uh, directed to a process machine or manufacturer or composition of matter? What you do like in a, a software situation, it is a process. So, but then the, whole, the next question is, does the claim, okay, it's a process, but does it reside an abstract idea? Let's say you might say a method of uh, re resolving or reconciling my bank statements. Uh, it's a mental, pro it's a process, but it's a mental process, right? So that's what we mean by it's a process, but it's still a mental process. And as is, it doesn't provide any eligibility um, check marks for us in the positive. So you have to focus in this area. And they, the way that they do the um, examination makes it very clear. 
if you do it step by step. And I said, don't skip a step. If you do it step by step, it really helps you understand it, um, how to get around and actually focus on your invention. So what are some of the things that fall in the groupings that we were just talking about? Mental process are mathematical relationships, formulas or equations and calculations, mathematical concepts. Oh, that's actually, um, I uh, duplicated it, so sorry for that. Uh, certain methods of organizing human activity, like fundamental economic principles, hedging, insurance, mitigating risk, balancing your checkbook, commercial or legal interactions, and managing personal behavior, which is actually important in digital health, um, or interactions between people. Um, so that is the part that is really important for us to also keep in mind. So the patent office goes through that and they look and say, okay, does it belong to whatever is described? How does it fit with one of these categories? So now you get to prong two. You have to look for additional elements or a combination of elements like, or a certain order that apply, rely on, or use those abstract ideas or judicial exceptions in a manner that imposes a meaningful limit. And let's look at an example in a few, few minutes. A practical tip for you is that you have to show your claim combination, the order, and I keep repeating the same words because they matter. They are unconventional. The unconventionality also relates to the novelty question, which is another criteria, but we haven't even gotten there. But you know, if it's not new, it's not patentable anyway. So you have to have things that are put together in an unconventional way. And the, the context for the whole idea of inventive concept is that it's prior art. So as you are evaluating your own invention, compare it to the prior art. Tell me what is, um, how does yours overcome whatever are the issues or shortcomings of the prior art? We do that already with machines and pharmaceuticals and other things, right? We're all, always trying to compare things, but that's more important in the question of digital health because it's suffering from this whole cloud of uh, uh, abstract ideas, uh, dilemma. So compare those limitations to prior technologies that have been um, trying to solve the same problems so that you can show the benefits of the invention. So benefits really are re important um, in terms of how you describe your invention here. So if you have a claim that integrates your judicial exception to a practical application, what happens? It has to rely on, use something in a meaningful way, then you are okay to pass go. And then you have the other challenges to, of course, pass as well, but this is the first gate. Now, some practical tips. How can you describe your invention um, or as you review your application prepared by your counsel, how do you look at things? First of all, please, 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 this is one of the most important areas. Emphasize technical features and solutions. This is, Patent Office is not your investor. They don't care about marketing. They don't care about the slide deck. The aspect of the marketing part, what's important is you describing the benefits, right? That's the benefit part. But in terms of what you've invented, you have to focus on technical features and solutions, right? Do emphasize how it is and is better over prior art. Don't try and avoid things that are business methodologies, like um, send a message to the scheduler. That, that's more like a, what they call a business method. You can have some of that, but you have to emphasize the technical features. But to the extent that you can try and avoid them. Um, do not put things in your application that says this is a conventional. Because if you say it's conventional, it will be treated as conventional. So it's kind of like when you say anything you say can and will be held against you, that's one of them. Um, so let's see what else. Um, recite specific elements and or ordered combinations. If the order, what happens is in a lot of patent claims, especially traditional processes, we don't, we try not to limit something to the order in which it's introduced to the extent possible because we want it to be um, viewed as, interpreted as broadly as possible. But to the extent that order matters, do describe that. And a lot of 
you know, digital inventions, <clears throat> order does matter. Um, don't just talk about use of data. I mean, uh, generating of the data. Talk about how you're going to use that data. Um, as usual, use your broad to narrow approach when, you know, is being drafted. And of times people tell me, well, if I provide too much specifics, um, then it's going to be narrowed. Well, first of all, pro providing specifics in your specification, in your description, has nothing to do with what you claim at the end anyway. I mean, you don't have to claim it narrowly, but you may probably need it down, cross, down the line as, you know, your attorney goes back and forth with the patent office. So put all the specifics that could be relevant to you uh, and let the scope be determined by the claims, not by what you put in there. Um, don't be overly broad. I know we all want to have the broadest uh, interpretation, but in order to take it away from the concept of um, abstract ideas, you have to give it an application and giving something an application makes, you know, makes it to be narrower. And of course, use different kind of claims and your attorney can work with you on that. Um, so same thing with, with AI. Uh, you want to, um, first of all, if you can, try and just not even get to the abstract idea. So to the, ex to the extent that you can prepare your, have your attorney or yourself prepare the claims that can actually pass go from step one without even getting to all of that other prong one, prong two, and so on, do it that way. But if it's not possible, talk about the integration, uh, training and updating or optimizing a computer model, um, being more efficient techniques for extracting the variables. And these are, of course, will be available for you to look at also, but again, you're trying to be as specific as you can. Um, this is the example that we were talking about earlier, and uh, let's see. Basically, you remember the examples of the two, and in the interest of time, let's go through this and we can always come back and look at it. Let me show you what the court or the patent office relies on in this situation. You can see there is a lot of step-by-step uh, -step analysis, I think. All right. So the shorter claim, it was the, re the issue with that was that as a whole, it only describes how it was done generally. They basically just used a general all purpose computer and you know you transmit data from this to that there was no other uh, spe specific information in there like making things so that they have the same format uh, that we were that was in the other claim the one that was in the green background so let me see if i can find the other one where um this actually has more of the detail so if you look at this claim remember this was this, uh, the first claim that was uh is viewed to be patent uh, eligible. They do talk about generating a message automatically, right, or right away. And the other part had to do with using the graphical user interface when the user provide updated information. There, these were all specific uh, improvements over um, the prior art. Uh, standardized, updated information, that was another attribute or feature that in the analysis patent office says that removes it from that whole general purpose to something more unique and more applied. So you have to move your mindset from um, research and put it into applied research if you kind of could draw those analogies uh, between the two. So um, I don't know how much more time we have uh, Ashley and Ryan um, we can go line by line through some of these examples, but I'm hoping that at least it provides some basis for um, how to think about it. Um, bring it down to earth. There's no such thing as cloud, as I always say, you know, everything comes down to some sort of a server somewhere. So think of it in reality of how things work together and uh, let the claims narrow your scope if necessary, but as the, somebody who's providing the content to your attorney, provide not just a broad um, you know, um, framework for what your invention is, but provide the details of how this is applied and all the details and let and work with your attorney to come up with the scope 
so that it's not too narrow, but it's narrow enough that can pass the, uh, the broad, um, uh, broadness issues that uh, abstract ideas a lot of times uh, suffer from. I'm going to stop for a minute, uh, Ryan and Ashley, and kind of do a time check um, before going into more details of the examples. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, we're scheduled till 12, um, so we have about eight, um, you know, 17 minutes left, you know, maybe factor in some for Q&A as well, if that's helpful. Yeah, so do we want to um, take some uh, questions first, if there are any? Because what I want to do is I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty of something that is more legalese and kind of focus more on how the technologists and our viewers um, or participants can, how can they help their attorneys do the work? Absolutely. Okay, so um, if anybody would like to either type the question in the Q&A or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Uh, Feel free to do so. If not, they can kind of emphasize again, at least in this one example, um, what was important as um, the analysis shows on the right hand side, was that in this example of the patent, they're both the same invention, right? So the applicant had come up with the invention and the flow chart that I showed earlier, and they had two types of claims. The two claims, they differed in what and how much they provided in terms of content and specific applications. And one is viewed as patent eligible, and one is viewed as not. This is the one that in the example, in this hypothetical, is viewed as patent eligible. It passes that 101 gate. Why? Because there's a specific improvements over the prior art systems. It allows the remote users to share that information in real time in a standardized format, regardless of the format that it, the information was input by the user. So the claim as a whole, and that's what you have to do. You look at it as a whole, it integrates the certain methods of organizing human activity, that's true, but it's putting it in a practical application without having those additional elements that were put into the claim, then they're merely you know, just organizing human activity. There's nothing about non-standardized format. Um, it's just about, I send, I receive, you get notified. Um, so that is a good example and the patent office actually on their website have a lot of examples of um, in all different disciplines uh, that relates to patent eligibility like I mean by disciplines I'm talking about like uh, let's say digital health here and maybe agriculture they also do a lot of digital right so they have examples uh, in a range of uh, technology or industry um, areas I see one. Yeah, we do. Um, oh, Josh, where did you draw the line between fundamental technical IP versus applied learning? Okay, so the question that Josh has is where do you draw the line between fundamental technical IP versus applied? Notification, for example, seems non patentable, yet if used in a certain way, then they are. So, first of all, the one thing is, the examples, because these are hypotheticals provided by the patent office. I mean, there's a whole, and there's a great presentation somebody else had for, it was like a legal presentation that had a host of cases that, you know, if you want to get into real examples, we can have uh, citations of real uh, cases, but this is hypothetical. This example is not trying to say notification is new per se. This is just trying to pass what is the 101 eligibility requirement. 101 is a different gate altogether from novelty, which is uh, what you're normally um, concerned with. Because in normal traditional hardware, a machine has been by statute is patentable, right? So we never really had to worry about does it pass the 101 gate. Um, it's the software area where um, we are more concerned about in this situation. So Applied IP is, is like they're taking these mental processes or even notification, but they're putting something extra is now being applied. Um, 
in the sense that, um, let's see, um, having immediate access, how they're enabling that in this specification provides um, how it is an applied situation versus it's just notification. Also, this example, please don't uh, view it as, well, everybody's notifying these days because this is not, again, for about novelty and whether somebody has done it before. This is actually just a very easy example to just show how do you decide 101. Um, the other thing is that we look at the claim as a whole. It's not just about the one notification aspect, but it's also about the fact that it takes a range of things that there's no standardized form to them and converts them into a standard form. For example, what is still missing, and maybe you guys might know of a company that is doing this already. There is one actually Stanford Medical School uses where uh, you could, uh, they would provide portals, for example, uh, and you put input your password, username, and so on, and it would draw um, the information from those portals and put it in all one place. But that one is still not doing standardized format in many situations. Because when I want to do my medical things and see a new doctor, I actually have a huge spreadsheet that I have to go to Kinko's or whatever to print it. Um, so, and I can put it on a, it literally fills a wall because you know, I want to compare all of my test results, not, not just by date, but by parameter. I want to chart them so the doctor can see it very easily. Uh, some of these portals still are, at best, they're converting certain reports into a PDF, but there's still not enough to extract and make it OCR and so on for um, every situation. And if that could happen, that would be great. Is OCR by itself new? No. Um, again, there might, somebody might have already done this. I'm not saying that they haven't, but um, it's uh, putting it all together. That's what as a whole refers to. Every element matters, but at the end of the day, don't just they say, like, take a person as, as a whole person, not just one, one attribute. So that's what you need to kind of take a look at it as well. Ryan, what, what questions might you have? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned a, a number of factors that you know, can be very specific to particular cases. I wonder about some of the items that are probably you know, maybe le less under our control. Like, for instance, you know, if I'm trying to assess whether I think I have a pretty good success rate of getting this through, I can use the criteria. But maybe are there other things that you know, we can be thinking about as well that, or that we should be aware of, for instance, like, um, does this particular, um, you know, patent prosecutor um, have a, like a very low approval like percentage or something like, you know, th things like that that might be a little bit less obvious to assess the, you know, whether we might be issued or not? Of course. So, examiners themselves, so there's actually a chart also that talks about uh, which um, the, prop, you know, certain behavior by certain examiners. It doesn't identify the examiner by name but that some of them, they're more predictable in their responses and some are not. And the unfortunate thing is that sometimes we're stuck with the examiner. Um, sometimes we can file um, and if, you know, a request after several office actions go back and forth uh, to have an interview with the supervisor as well. That has helped sometimes when you're stuck with an examiner that, um, some of them are really good at it, but then sometimes they just get caught up in one thing that is you really think is not um, fair or they're not correct in it. And then at some time like that, it's good to bring a third party in like the supervisor and so on and go through the examination again. Uh, whether it was mechanical type situations or even um, digital. Um, we've had cases where we get it allowed you know, much easier and then there's sometimes we have cases that, you know, it goes on and on. And sometimes, unfortunately, the examiners keep changing mm -hmm. on the same case. And then you have to restart the, the whole thing all over again. Uh, some of the things you can do is, like, they typically look at your title. Like when things go to, the, when you file, the way they assign it to certain, what they call an art group, is based on your abstract and your title. And maybe even your first uh, uh, figure that you say this is the one. Trying, that was one of the comments, was try and stay away from problematic art groups. And that is, don't use 
you know, like titles that might imply that it's just a mental process. Mm. Because if you send it to those, then it's much, it's going to be much harder to, you know, because those examiners are trained a certain way. Uh, maybe they, it's a bunch of uh, cases that they get is a certain way. So try and stay away from problematic art areas. Now, if you're working with an attorney who's doing a lot of that work, they might know which um, art units to stay away from, and then they can kind of help massage um, the titles and the abstracts. Uh, something like, I may not know which doctor is the one who, you know, can, you know, solves problems the best or not because I'm not in the field and I have to rely maybe on somebody who can make a recommendation. Um, so that's that's the one area. But a couple of things that I see routinely where it could have been better, but unfortunately, and that's where the inventors have control over. That's where I would focus. They always say, if you can't control something, focus on things you can control, right? First, first and foremost, is provide details. Uh, again, it's a common misnomer and misunderstanding that if they provide specific examples, whether it's, a, let's say, a, a material science, and say, oh, if I say it's this um, polymer and that polymer specifics is gonna narrow my um, invention. No, narrowness and broadness is defined by the claims but do provide specifics as much as you can, even though they're narrow, in the specification, in the drawings. And because processes have, you also have to show the, show the process in figure. So drawings are not just important for like mechanical cases and apparatus, but anything that is you're gonna claim, you have to show it. In chemical cases, yes, we have formulas, but in terms of processes, you have to have those flow charts. So please do show those flowcharts. Drawings do matter and they matter a great deal um, because um, one, the patent office requir is required. And then um, secondly, it puts things in context. So I would say as somebody focus on what you can control mm -hmm. and provide details as much as you can. And if you're working with an attorney, work with them to then figure out what's important, what's not, and what's, mi not, what's missing. Don't leave that to the attorney because as great, a tech, maybe they all have technology backgrounds, obviously, but you're the king of your field, not the attorney as much as they understand things. Um, so that's what I would control because that's the only thing I as an inventor can control. I hope great. that kind that's of answers great. the question. It does. It looks like we have another one. It says, uh, if you offer a remote clinical test, is the combination of different techniques patentable? Well, it, it depends on what techniques we're talking about. It depends on what is the state of prior art for a remote clinical test. Um, for example, I remember coming to some of your uh, seminars and uh, some of the eWare seminars, right? Mm -hmm. Where you know people are trying to do digital evaluation of somebody's, I don't know if it was a skin, skin or when they go to the bathroom, you know, doing it just from pictures, right? So I'm assuming, that, well, I guess that would be a re remote clinical test in a way, because you have the sample and a specimen, you take a picture and the analysis gets done remotely. But there's a lot of, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, science and engineering that goes behind that analysis. Um, so if it's that kind of a thing you're talking about, assuming it hasn't been done before the way that um, we are thinking about it, of course, it, that, if you draft it properly, that definitely would pass the 101. Um, so um, a remote clinical test is a combination, different techniques. It depends on the techniques and, the, and has that been done before. Um, that's a 102 issue. But if you can describe it for a 101, you can talk about the technique is this or that and make it specific application, that more than likely will pass the 101 gate so that you can pass go <laughs> as in Monopoly. Yeah, and uh, Martin, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to say it depends, but we need a lot of facts around that. And I guess one um, other re-emphasizing is be 
very careful, please, 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 with provisional applications. Because it was meant to make things, well, it wasn't meant that way anyway. It was supposed to put on par the 20 year term with European practice. And uh, actually, pharmaceutical industry takes, is one of the biggest industries that takes advantage of it and has from day one. But, um, and they can definitely afford <laughs> paying for a non provision, but there's other reasons they do that. Um, is that it can actually cause a lot of harm if you don't do it right. Um, I've seen inventors where they filed a provisional, they didn't put all the right information and then they started talking about it and it was no longer really novel by the time you know they wanted to file something. Yes, they have a one year period themselves, but in Europe you don't have that grace period of one year. Plus there's a whole bunch of other, I call silver bullets that can still kill your uh, patentability, uh, even though there is a one year uh, grace period. Um, and that it, in many ways that can be very, very dangerous. So be very careful that provisions are not to be, they're not meant, they're easier. You don't have to have certain formalities, but just like anything else, they're only as good as what you provide in them. So um, I would say be, Please, I can't emphasize enough because I've seen too many good inventors with good ideas really suffer because it's been poorly drafted. So I guess, you know, I, I'll leave this off with one, one last question, I guess, since we're, we're almost out of time. Um, so at, since we have a lot of inventors on the line, when would you recommend them coming to you? Like at what stage, you know, give, you know, we have some resources at Stanford, obviously, but you know, what's the best path to engage with you? Because maybe they don't see it from your perspective as well. First of all, your IP strategy is part of your business strategy. So uh, I have a whole series of other um, presentations on different topics and I'll be more than happy to come back and share with you some of the different things to consider, but IP is part of your business strategy. So, and it is better to know that you don't want to file something than to let other people decide for you. I'd rather make the wrong decision myself than have somebody else, you know, kind of determine my fate. So have those dis discussions early on. You might say, oh, it's too expensive. I don't want to file it. First of all, find out what does expensive mean. Um, it's like, Climate change can be afford not to take care of you know and address it. We can't, and not don't know, no matter what the price tag is. But look at it as a business component of your strategy. Then, if you wait too long, but by, by the time you want to put it into, uh, let's say you want to do some of your clinical testing before you file, by that time it's probably too late. Um, if you have an idea, it doesn't mean that you have to go. Um, do a foreign filing and everything else. I would say always do your IP strategy first. Talk to me or whoever uh, to make sure that you understand the elements. It doesn't mean you have to file. They were talking about just strategy. Because sometimes what we think of strategy actually may not be true. In that case, well, that's good because it either eliminates certain issues or addresses certain questions. Um, so talk to someone who uh, is not just a drafter, but it also a strategic person who understands the strategy. Figure out your strategy, then decide when you can make it a reality, whether it's a question of money or whether it's a question of content, whatever it is, by that time you'll know what those factors are. Um, and I would say, I think of, let's say provisional like a soup. If you've got the carrots and celeries and potatoes, you can still make a soup, even though you don't have everything else that you want in your soup. You can't file that. Doesn't mean you can't. Um, so those are the kind of questions that I think if you talk with the strategies early on, when you're trying to come, when you know I want to do something with what I got, talk to someone who can um, look at it from a strategic perspective and then creates your timeline and your trigger points for you. Um, one of the other trigger points for me as to when you want to talk to someone is I always go with the premise. I used to tell this to my colleagues at HP was you know you're not stupid you know you're diligent and you work hard and you know you're smart you're, you got something here when you have that then look you know that should be your first clue that maybe it's something there that i can protect 
because you're not lazy and you're smart <laughs> and you're, you put some considerable length of time. Time is not a requirement, but if you have put energy and resources into something and you've come up with something, probably there's something there for you to consider from a protection. And just at the back of the hand kind of a um, calculation, uh, typically for every patent you get, if nothing else, you can uh, increase your valuation by about over a million dollars. And if you're trying to get that funding early on, every dollar amount for have a higher valuation matters to you from a dilution perspective when you're trying to get money, equity money. Um, and that's just not even analyzing it for its application and market side. That's just a quick litmus test. Um, so I don't know, I can go, you know me, I can go on forever on this, but I would say early on, get your strategy in order before you even tackle the specifics. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Well, thanks so much, Sudi. And, you know, if anyone ever wants to reach out to her, I'm happy to make connections. Um, you know, it's, happy to, as always. Yeah, it's and, been a pleasure. Uh, same here. And I look forward to getting, um, continuing on the mentorship program for your students as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Sudi's very involved. So, you know, it's, it's, great. it's great to have her in multiple capacities. So, all right, everyone, you have a great day. And uh, thanks again, Sudi. Thank you. Bye-bye.